Today I have the privilege of interviewing Mr. Uh, Herschel Ford. Mr. Ford served in the 463rd Bomb Group in the Second World War. 464th. 464th Bomb Group in the Second World War and has allowed me to interview him about his story. So if you would, Mr. Ford, uh, maybe start off by telling us a little bit about your life before the war. You know, before the war, in the 30s, my father was a, a hired worker for a, uh, on a farm in Indiana. And a uh, 10 year period from 30 to 40. Uh, I was born in that area of the state near Matthews, Indiana, on my grandfather's farm. Uh, drawing a blank. <laughs> but uh, finished high school in 1942 and uh, was able to get started going to school at Purdue University in the fall of 1942. And the draft age at that time, the war had been going on for some time. Started on December the 7th, which everybody knows. Uh, the draft age was 18 when I started going to school at Purdue and they lowered it. I mean, draft age was 21 and they lowered it to 18 on about September. 1942 and I stayed in school at Purdue for about one year before I was drafted and I was drafted uh, in the fall of 1943. Went to basic, went to you know, the induction center, uh, took exams and was able to get into the Air Force. Uh, Went to basic training at Biloxi, Mississippi, and there I took more exams and uh, got into uh, av aviation cadet training and was sent after basic training to the University of Florida for four months at the beginning of that uh, aviation cadet training. At the end of that four month period, the military evidently and decided they had too many people in this program and weren't going to need them. And all of us that finished the program, you know, in the spring of 1944, were sent back to wherever they came from. The ones that came from the Navy went to the Navy, and their army, ground troops went back to the army. And because of the way I was drafted, I was left in the Air Force and went to gunnery school uh, at Laredo, Texas and learned to operate turrets and, and the functioning of 50 caliber machine guns there. And from after that training, I went to crew training at Tonopah, Nevada, uh, which lasted a, a few months. Uh, the crew got oriented into operating and flying on a, a B-24. Uh, after finishing the, the crew training, uh, I was sent to the West Coast, San Francisco, I think it was Hamilton Air Force Base, to be shipped someplace, and I thought it would probably be uh, in the Pacific area, but they put us on a train and moved us back across the United States to Norfolk, Virginia. And from there I was, our crew was shipped to uh, uh, Italy. We landed in, uh, in Italy at Naples and one of the things I remember about the place where we landed in Italy was there were a lot of damaged ships, airship ships over on their sides and uh, had been sunk by I suppose American forces before I got there and our Landing platform was the side of a ship that was on the side that we walk, walked into the line on that, and then got on another ship in, that was a British type ship and shipped us around from Naples, Italy, to Foggia, Italy, which was on the east side of Italy, and Naples on the west side. And from Foggia, we were moved to. Terignola, which is a small town, I think northeast 
of Foggia and that area, where our bomb group was stationed, and started flying missions there. There are some kind of interesting details about the way you live when you under those circumstances. When we got there, of course, we had no quarters, but they issued us a 16 by 16 foot tent and, and cots to sleep on and told us to go over and put it up on that hillside, you know, at a certain place. So we did that and set it up to live in it for the next few months. And as the time went by, when we weren't flying missions, while we worked on trying to improve our living quarters and hired, hired the Italians to do things for us. We ended up building a block enclosure around the bottom of the tent uh, made out of stone. And I remember it being called Tufa Block. And the stones were about the size of, you know, the, the concrete building uh, blocks that you buy today. And they also put a floor in the tent for us that we thought was cement, but apparently wasn't because it kind of turned to a dusty powder when it got good and dry. And but we lived in it. It was made made the tent a lot more comfortable. Heated it in the winter time with 100 octane gasoline. I had a 55 gallon drum sitting outside the tent when we salvaged aluminum tubing from wrecked planes and ran it into a half a barrel that we put uh, shell casings on for a flue to run up through the tent and punched holes in that aluminum tubing and curled it up. Uh, and made kind of a coil in the bottom of the, of the barrel to burn the gasoline and uh, uh, give us some heat in the tent. Uh, that far south in Italy it wasn't real cold but it was, we had snow on the ground frequently and uh, it was uncomfortably cold in the tent. I think today you wouldn't be allowed to burn 100 octane gasoline like that. but. Uh, it made, it made the living more comfortable when we could heat water on that barrel then to take a bath in a helmet liner and, uh, until we could get better facilities constructed on the base. And eventually we did get group shower stalls built and heated with gasoline so we could take hot showers, you know, after it had been there two or three months. Uh, I don't remember much detail uh, about, I, I know we didn't have to do anything except fly and uh, there were several months I you only know, flew about once or twice a week and the missions were you know, from six to nine hours long and went up over various bases in uh, Germany. Uh, the names of some of the places, of course Vienna, everybody knows, Berlin, uh, Black Hammer, Linz, and I, I don't recall other, other places that we bombed, but I have a list of that in my archives here someplace at home. Uh, one of the unusual things that happened to us in our flying missions was on one of our missions, we were going to Vienna and our air, airplane lost an engine about uh, two hours after we took off, but we were able to keep up with the formation and fly with them until uh, we got pretty close to Vienna. Then a second one engine went out and we could no longer keep up with the formation and fly with them, so we had to go back to Italy by ourselves. And I, our pilot must have known what he was doing because we had mountains to clear to, to get back to the area where we could make a safe landing and had been briefed about alternate places that you could land if, if you're trying to get back, you know, 
under exactly the same circumstances we were in. Uh, so the pilot, we jettisoned the bomb someplace in Italy, I mean in Germany, uh, and threw everything else that weighed anything in the plane out. We took our flak jackets off, took the insides of the guns out, threw everything that weighed anything out of the plane to make it as light as it could so it could, we could go as far as we could back towards our home base. And we ended up making a, a landing at a, a small field in Yugoslavia that the Yugoslav partisans had just kicked the Germans out of and landed there. Uh, and the plane, the, the runway was short, so the plane went over the end of the runway and ended up at about a 90 degree angle with the nose down in the mud. And the first thing we thought of was an explosion or a fire. We tried to jump out of it and run and get as far away from it as you could, as quick as you could. The Yugoslav partisans picked us up, took us into the, a little town. And I remember staying in the upstairs of like a store building overnight. And the United States Air Force sent a C-47 in the next day and picked us up, took us back. So we were back on flying status, the same as we'd been before. Uh, ended up being credited with 35 missions, these various places over Germany. And near the, near the end of the war, the last week before the war ended, I was at rest camp on the Isle of Capri. And a uh, beautiful place and they housed us in hotels and private homes that evidently we, we were took over. I, I, I don't know what kind of arrangements they had with the owners of those places, but I ended up staying for a week in a real palatial private home. One of the things I remember about it was the, the bathroom had black marble fixtures. It was a, a beautiful place. And we had dinners in an every day in a hotel dining room, and it was a nice week of rest and recuperation. And the day we left there, it was announced that the war in Germany ended, so I flew no more missions after that. Went back to our base, and within a few days we were dismantling it and getting ready to move. Uh, came back to the United States ra rather early. I was probably back here by July uh, of 45 and got to go home and see the family and, and went back on duty in the Air Force. Ended up in Florida getting ready to be shipped to the Pacific area to fly more missions, and the, the atomic bomb ended the uh, situation in, with Japan, and they surrendered, and within uh, two or three months of that time, uh, I was moved up to Lockburn Air Force Base at Columbus, Ohio, so I was close to my home. I'd go home on weekends, uh, and got released from the Air Force. Uh, Air Force active duty on October of 1945, back in school at Purdue by November 1st of 1945. That's a kind of a rough summary of some of the things I was exposed to. And uh, so, what did you do after, after the war and up until now? Well, after the war, of course, I, I finished my degree at Purdue. I had a, got a bachelor's degree. I only had about two more years to finish. Uh, so I graduated in 1947. The bachelor's degree took a job with Armour and Company in a laboratory in Fort Worth, Texas. Went down there and worked for a few months. Got a call from Texas A&M University, asked if I was interested in a job there and work on another degree. So I called the head of the department at Purdue 
to talk to him about it. He said, well, if you want to do something like that, why don't you come back to Purdue? So that's what I ended up doing uh, after the war. And I worked at Purdue then for, got my, a master's degree and worked there for 20 years uh, with the dairy industry in the state of Indiana. And after that, uh, when I decided to do something else, I got involved in the real estate business in Lafayette, Indiana. Worked for somebody else for about one year, then I opened my own firm and operated that until I retired. Thank you very much for doing an interview with me. It's yep. been a pleasure. Thank you.